Hello and morning. I say morning and I understand that to, uh, I guess, a number of you, it's not morning at all. For a number of you, it'll be late evening, perhaps even night time. And due to this wonderful thing called technology, some of you will be watching this many days later. So let me just tell you right for now, uh, in my world here now, it's, it's a Thursday. The sun is almost poking through, which isn't bad for England in November. So uh, there'll be a little bit of preamble. Just as we begin to welcome people as they connect into this Facebook Live event. So I'll do some preamble, a little bit about me. You'll get yourself nice and comfortable. A cup of tea or a coffee or a glass of wine if it's the evening. So as you get yourself comfortable and into, I guess, the zone to listen, really, I'll tell some stories. And then once we've told the stories, we'll get into this thing called three-dimensional leadership. And some of you will have watched the video, which I've pre-recorded, and some of you won't have done. And whichever that is, is completely fine as well. What would be really helpful would be to know kind of how many of you have watched it and haven't watched it. And clearly no judgment over whether that's happened for you or not. There could have been a load of reasons why you didn't get the video, didn't see the video, uh, couldn't download the video, ran out of time, prioritised more important things. So uh, completely fine if you've not seen the pre-recorded video. That's absolutely fine. I'm going to repeat the stuff I'm saying now um, a little bit later, just as people join in this morning. And it would be lovely, I don't know if you are better able at using this technology than I am, so you may be, you may know how to send comments or questions or suggestions or tags or anything else that uh, you can do on these Facebook Live events. Uh, you'll be the masters, I imagine, greater than I am. So I can see that Marco has joined. Um, Marco, hi. Lovely for you to be here. And over time, we may be joined by other people. And it may just be me and you. In which case, we can go into some more depths about the kind of things that you'd be interested in. So Marco, it would be lovely if I could just um, know where you're, you're dialing in from, which, which country are you in? That'd be nice for me to know, to give me some kind of context. So if you are able to find the, the way to chat in Facebook Live, just pop in where you're from. So the structure that I'm hoping to go through today, and it's flexible because I can have a structure, and then it may be a question that takes us in a completely different direction, and um, that's completely cool. In fact, that's preferable. But if that isn't the case, then um, the structure that I propose, the preamble, a little bit about me, um, a little bit about the context for you, Depending on how many people that I get a sense of watch the pre-video, that'll depend on how much detail I go into the model itself. So it may be that we just jump straight into your experience, your reflections, your comments or your questions. And it may be that I'll do a, a summary of the model that we're talking about, which is the three-dimensional model of leadership. It may be that I do that in depth. So whatever it is, completely fine. And then pretty quickly, though, we'll go from this theoretical thing into how do we make something kind of real for you. So you being the case study here. We're not looking at how, uh, I was going to say Barack Obama, but more topical, how Donald Trump might lead or Theresa May or the Dalai Lama or whoever it is we want to think about a leadership. We could do case studies on them uh, and that would be of interest. But only kind of theoretical, technical, let's write an essay about it, interesting. But not really transformational for you. 
So the important thing here is that you're able to connect the theory of the model into something that's kind of useful for you. So we'll spend, I would, say, I would hope, the majority of the call, maybe at least two thirds of the call on what it is that you would like to get for the model, um, which areas of the model you find most interesting, which you find most challenging, and how you might shift your own development or your own capabilities so that you can lead your teams more effectively. And I know that you leading your teams more effectively makes the Commonwealth a greater Commonwealth. So I've got a wonderfully vested interest with two amazing children. This man's now two years old, called Wilbur. And this pretty lady here is, um, this is Olive. So my two lovely children, are grow, I grow up in a better world because of the work that you're doing. And um, so I'm really grateful. And thank you for doing that. And I hope that what we'll cover today I guess the whole Queen Young Leaders program has given you the some tools, some capabilities, some inspiration, perhaps, to go and achieve even more than you would have done on your own. So thanks from these kids. Marco, Dean, lovely that you're here. Um, I'm going to check on my laptop to see um, to see that things are working. Could you just post, if you can, uh, post that you can hear me well enough um, and also the country that you're from. That'd be lovely. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like we're live. And it's uh, in the UK, eight minutes past eight. Uh, and more people may join us, and many more people might watch this in the catch up mode. The video that was recorded uh, yesterday, um, two days ago, with Professor Paul Coyle. So I think on the call itself, there were kind of a handful of people maximum. And now I'm looking at it and there's 49 views. So clearly the, the catch up is maybe where a majority of people get their information from. So Marco, Dean, may, more people may join us. And if they don't, that's completely fine as well, because we're recording something now for the catch up people. So you have the ability to post whatever questions you like and um, all of your colleagues on the Queen's Young Leaders Programme will benefit from the questions you might be posting. I was also going to run a little live quiz as well with um, a prize at the end. The prize being, um, if I can find it right now, the prize being a signed copy of the three-dimensional book. Um, I'm not sure I run it with two of you. <laughs> it doesn't feel quite right. Maybe I'll run it online. Um, uh, but maybe I'll post a question here at the end of this video. So let's shoot for about a half an hour call, maybe a 40 minute call. Um, uh, and at the end, some kind of quiz that if you stick with it through to the end, and if you're sticking with the end on the catch up, then we'll still make sure that you've got the ability to join that quiz, uh, which will take you maybe 30 seconds to complete and could result in you getting a signed copy of the three dimensional book. So there we are. I think we'll move on because it's now seven minutes past eight. Anybody else can catch up if they like to. And we've done enough preamble to fill a bit of time. Okay. Where do we start? Where do we start? Should I say something about me? Maybe briefly, huh? Maybe briefly. My name's Todd Eden. I live in England. In my early career, I spent, so I've got an engineering degree, first of all. My early career, I was at Rolls-Royce, um, part of the aero engines division. There I was negotiating contracts, so my role was mainly working with international companies on pretty large deals. And it was an incredible experience, it taught me a lot about leadership. And um, Rolls-Royce were also really lovely about the training that they gave, so... You know, training the soft skills training about knowing yourself, psychometric testing, Myers Briggs, all the stuff about self awareness. I moved from Rolls Royce to a company called Britvic Soft Drinks, and I was there for ten years. 
And uh, Britvic Soft Drinks is the UK's largest uh, soft drinks manufacturer. Uh, Coca-Cola sell more things, but they're not British. Um, so Britvic is the British, the biggest British soft drinks manufacturer, making, marketing, and selling brands such as Pepsi and Seven Up, Tango, a home brand here, Robinson's the biggest squash brand perhaps in the world, um, and there are various roles from procurement, supply chain, project management, and ultimately the innovation team. So that was a corporate career that was lovely and enjoyable. And I had some really great bosses that I learned from. And I was a boss at times. I was a boss. And at times I was good. And at times, on reflection, not so good. And that's all a learning experience. And now I've learned that, okay, the not so good stuff, you can judge yourself and beat. I can beat myself up about it. But actually, these are... The, the not so good stuff, those are the great case studies that I can bring into something like this process now. Looking at the different modes of leadership and saying, okay, when when was I strong, when was I weak, and what what could I have done better? In hindsight. What a lovely thing. What a lovely thing hindsight is. So a kind of fifteen year corporate career that uh, went pretty well. Um, but then this little lady was born, she's now eight. And at that moment I was thinking, okay, I can be really successful in this corporate life, but really have contributed nothing of kind of value or benefit to her generation. I could have uh, grown market share, created shareholder value, outperformed Coca-Cola, grown brand equity, bought really nice cars for myself, all of that stuff, but none of it mattered to a little kid. So it was in that moment I thought, well, i got to shift. And um, so when thinking about what could I shift to, what can I contribute to this world, I landed on this thing around young people and high performance. So uh, um, I enjoy working with people generally in their 20s and early 30s. Um, because the brain is still wiring, the brain is still malleable, there's still a desire to learn which is more difficult when you get to in your 40s and 50s when habits are so deeply, deeply ingrained and sometimes you're a bit cynical about the world. So, yeah, I really wanted to work with um, yeah 20-year-olds, early 30s. Um, and my, my capability, my skills is, and my network wasn't necessarily with people who have struggled in life, who are... Um, yeah, my, my experience has all been with those kind of high performance, intellectually bright and people with ambition. And so that's where I wanted to work. With people who wanted to make a difference in the world and with the capability and ambition to do so. So the idea of kind of getting a chance to talk through this medium and more directly next year with some of the people from the Queen's Young Leaders that was right up my street and completely kind of what I love doing. So, yeah, what, five years ago, set up a social enterprise called Lead Now, www.leadnow.net, if you like it. Um, and we're a social enterprise, and we run leadership programmes in a large number of universities in the UK. So large rooms of 30 to 70 students um, talking about this stuff, leadership of self, leadership of other people, leadership for society. And that's what I do. Um... Today, as I'm running this with you guys uh, this morning at an 8, eight o'clock slot here in the UK, and then a 6 p.m. slot uh, later tonight to catch the kind of uh, West, uh, so United States, South America. And in between the two, I'm taking a long train journey to a different country. You guys may know uh, where Wales is. Um, so a relatively long train journey. And I'm going there because tomorrow I'm with a number of amazing students from the University of uh, Cardiff Metropolitan. So that's me, those are my credentials, this is why I do what it is that I do. This is why I'm excited about working with you guys, who I see as being people who are going to shape my kids' world. You are kind of coming to the end, I guess, of your formal Queen's Young Leaders journey. And you're now looking at your final assignments. And during your time with Cambridge University, there's been various moments of kind of new context and new content and new lessons and you'll have been experiencing things on your projects too things that have gone well and things that have not gone well 
and your assignment is asking you to reflect on those things. And this idea of reflection is something just we don't we don't do that often. We're busy doing stuff minute by minute, moment by moment. So when someone asks you to step back and reflect, whew, the lessons you can learn, wow, they're remarkable. So I hope this final assignment that you've got, I think it's module seven for you, is a wonderful chance to look back at your journey as a Queen's Room leader and notice the stuff that's gone well and not gone so well. And take all the lessons out of those things. So it's not a judgment over, well, I've had a five out of ten year. That's not that's not the purpose of this thing. The purpose of this thing is to notice what hasn't gone well and what would I do differently next time? What has gone well? And how can I celebrate that and do more of it? Perhaps coach it. And that's really the purpose of the three-dimensional leadership. The three-dimensional grid. It's a tool to help self-reflection. I got a few questions before I started on this call. The first question from the shell was, uh, what led me to create this model? Um, well, it wasn't actually created by me. The first, the first time this model was written down was by um, my wonderful co-founder of Lead Now, a guy called Nigel Lineker. And he's written a number of books. I don't know, I've lost count, maybe six or seven books. And his latest book, uh, where is it? Uh, his latest look, book is this one. And I'm not sure if that appears back to front to you on the camera. Uh, it's called Leadership Paradoxes. It's shortlisted for Management Book of the Year. So he's written books on kind of leadership. Um, he's written kind of more philosophical books about why we're here. Um, why men don't feel um, so a lovely colleague of mine if you do get a chance kind of look him up so he was I believe the story goes in France at a cafe waiting for his family maybe his wife to complete a bit of shopping and um, in the classic story he has the napkin and he's just reflecting on these leadership programs he's been running and just con contemplating the way that um, all leaders got to lead themselves. And only through self-leadership can they then have the access to lead other people. And only through the leadership of other people then can they affect the, kind of the world. Now, I'm not going to talk about the world being the entire world. Clearly, if you're in a position of power, maybe your influence does stretch kind of around the world. Um, but for most of us, we draw the circle of our world around the world that we can affect. What can we influence? So when I think about my social enterprise, the world I can affect, um, I can affect the self-regard of students leaving universities in the UK. So that's maybe how I define my world. And he was thinking, okay, so in these different ways that, you know, there's a different way to lead myself than to lead others and to lead kind of society and the world that we affect. So I started making notes about that. Put that to one side. And on the other side, he was starting thinking about how leaders need to operate differently depending on when they're thinking about kind of what's happening right now. Uh, and being real and aware with kind of what's going on inside of them understanding what's happening for let's say a person sitting right in front of them so how are they right now you know and how am I interacting with them I'm kind of grounded with what's happening in the world and in society so um, knowing what's happening right now with let's say self-regard self-motivation handling stress amongst university students that's important to know right now what's the reality and there's a different type of leadership that's required for knowing that kind of stuff than the leadership that's required when we're thinking about the future. Uh, and that could be, again, about my personal future. So um, I could drift day by day. 
Or I can have some kind of sense of the destination of my journey. Some kind of sense that 40 year old Todd now, um, that is an enhanced version of me, that could be a 50 year old Todd, that's got some greater wisdom, that's learnt some lessons. So some sense that the me of the future could be something better than the me of today. And we can think about this kind of dimension of self in the now and in the future. And also other people. So a sense that the person I'm talking to now could be inspired by me to go achieve something in the future. And the world, I could create a vision which could help it to become a reality. And so the so Nigel had these kind of these thoughts about how do you kind of, how does a leader need to operate kind of right in the now and in the future and how does a leader need to operate kind of you know, inside and outside in the world and that's when he came up with these ideas of these two axes uh, so an axis of time uh, now the path or the way and the future and then the other axis which is about kind of me you and then the world. So those are the two axes. As soon as you put in the two axes, you end up with the nine spaces of leadership. So a three by three grid. And you guys will have this in your pack. So this is module this is module seven. And we're on page seven of module seven. And so this is the, the this is the thing that Nigel drew on the napkin. Um, which was the two two by two grid about time and space, which then ends up with nine boxes in the centre here. What's lovely about when you start to think about these nine boxes is that some of the terms that you would hear maybe randomly, you know, a visionary leader, you know, or a uh, a coaching leader, you can then start to put into some kind of um, framework or matrix, which can help to understand the rounded picture of leadership. We use this mod, this model now to structure our programs, uh, our leadership programs. So starting in with self, then leading others, and then leading teams. And it's a really useful tool when we have up on the board, just to keep referring back to kind of where we're talking about here. Um, and so there's nine modes. And some of you will have watched the video, and in the video I've gone through each of the nine different modes of leadership with a very brief kind of introduction of each and I'll do that briefly over the next kind of couple of minutes and for while I'm doing that and for those of you excuse me and for those of you who have um, watched the video seen the grid you may already have marked up where you feel that you are strong relatively and three areas maybe where you're weaker so it's important we turn this from a bit of theory into what's relevant to you. You're the case study here, remember? It's about you. And this is about shifting your leadership so that your project becomes more impact so my kid's world is a better place. So really important, this doesn't just be a mental exercise. Um, get your pen and paper, get your grid, and kind of mark up where do you think you're strong, where do you think you're weak? And in a moment, once... I've gone through those nine areas just to refresh your memory. I'm going to ask you to put it in the chat. And if you're watching this video afterwards, so not live, still put it in the chat because in a week's time there will be maybe 50 people who have seen the video. And it'll be interesting for me to see which areas, as a cohort, as a Queen Young Leaders cohort, you believe you're strongest in and weakest in and the area you'd like to develop because that would help me so write the program for next year and focus on things perhaps differently with your insights. Is that clear? Cool. So let me talk through each one of the different nine boxes. I should also say any time you've got a question, any time you want to say, Todd, you're talking too quickly, <laughs> Um, pop it in the chat and let me know. I would hate to find out afterwards that um, <laughs> you couldn't hear. Uh, so please, whatever comments, whatever feedback, uh, pop it in the chat and I'll react to it as soon as I notice it coming up on the screen. 
So I think I'll start bottom left on the grid. So what am I thinking about leading self in the now? This is all about being genuine. It's all about being real. It's all about being happy, being me. Knowing that me isn't perfect and never will be. So having some self-regard and yeah, being here and vulnerable and knowing that this is the third time I've run one of these things and it's better than the first two, but it's not perfect. Okay, I'll listen and I'll learn. So being real with everything that's happening for me right now, any nerves that I might have had before I started, all of that stuff, that's all about being genuine and authentic. So authentic leaders bring themselves to situations, bring themselves to the now. When I was thinking about kind of what pictures to put on my wall, what's my professional image, it was important to me that my kids kind of a part of my professional image. They are the reason why I'm doing what I do. And I like to talk about that. So that for me is me being authentic and real. So authentic leaders, where should we go next? Let's go to Inspired. I talked about this briefly about 10 minutes ago when I was talking about the grid in general. Inspired leaders have some sense that there is a future them that is something different, something better, something grander, something wiser than the them of today. So when you think about yourself now, at whatever age you are, if you would think about how you were 10 years ago, I imagine you know and you can see that you've grown. And you may have grown in a deliberate, conscious kind of way, or it might just have been the passage of time. So an inspired leader would know that the, well, the Todd of tomorrow is a different version of the Todd of today. I was inspired about that. And that then creates the journeying leader. The journeying leader knowing that there's stuff to learn. There's stuff to learn about myself, about my interaction with other people. And I'll be learning this stuff for life. There are so many books that exist that I've not read. There's so many books on this bookshelf that I've read and not really understood. Um, there's new science that's coming out every day, particularly the stuff around neuroscience and the way that we can study the brain in ways that we've never studied before. So as a journey and leader, ah, oh my goodness, the access to information that's free, that's relevant, that's cutting edge, means that all of us can create this habit of self-actualization. And so journey leaders are on this quest for self-development on a constant basis. So those are the three elements of self-leadership. Self-leadership, as I've said, the absolute foundation of any leadership. Going to the dimension of time, sorry, dimension of team. And I also remember what I want you to be doing as I'm talking through this thing. Think, okay, yeah, that's, you know, I'm really strong with that. I'm really weak at that. You might want to rate yourself out of 10 against each of these boxes just as I'm talking through it. So at the end, you can see where's your low score, where's your high score. So this is self-reflection. And it's important. So give yourself three scores. Authentic leaders, journeying leaders, inspired leaders. Three scores out of 10. And I'll carry on. So team, an adult leader, you might wonder what an adult leader is. Um, there's a great model, it's called, the, it's called transactional analysis, which isn't a great name. Um, introduced by a guy called Eric Byrne, and he introduced a language around parent, adult and child relationships. And that's a whole other topic, you know, that's a whole other subject. But in this context here, adult relationships, when you've got an adult to adult relationship to somebody else, it's... You're fostering non-hierarchical relationships. So it's not like I'm the boss and I'm telling you what to do and I'm treating you like you're, you're a child. No. Adult to adult respects one another's differences, one another's opinions, um, and can have empathy for other people's feelings and connect with them on a level. And some people I've met in my life are brilliant at doing that at all times and sometimes I catch myself not being like this even if I would like to think I'm like this um, and sometimes I've got a blind spot and a blind spot I was working in Dubai 
the week before last. I know a busy hotel, kind of restaurants for breakfast. And so I was kind of, you know, those waiters and waitresses buzzing around, being really efficient. And, you know, maybe if they came and gave me a glass of water or something, I'd say briefly thank you. But I really wasn't engaging with eye contact. Two other people on my table, they were so good. By the end of our week there, they knew the names of every member of staff. They knew the country they were from, they learned their language. I mean, these were properly engaging with people who were paid to wait, be waiters, but connecting with them on a level. No hierarchy, no kind of, well, I'm the customer, none of that. And so sometimes in life, my eyes get opened a bit wider as to how I could be a more adult leader. So anyway, adult leaders, non-hierarchical. You've probably heard of coaching. Coaching is getting performance out of somebody else. So you're enabling them to perform. It's not teaching. It's not mentoring. This is believing that you have the answers and that I'm here to help you to draw the answers out of you. So as a coaching leaders, inspiring leaders are those that help others to see the better version of themselves in the future. So inspired, I understand there's a better version of me for the future and I have a sense of what that could be. And equally, an inspiring leader is somebody who does that for somebody else. Score yourself across team dimension, adult leaders, coaching leaders, and inspiring leaders. So the top level of the grid now is the world. Uh, grounded leaders know what's happening right now in this moment. So, well, whatever you want to do, if you want to look at um, let me think whatever your project is your, your project might be about eyesight on, a, on an eye this, is, this reminds me of someone I met a couple of years ago on the Queen Young Leaders Programme about giving your eyesight it's about glasses basically so the insight was and the grounded leadership thing the thing of understanding was that there's this place in the world on this island where there is no what they call the people who sort out glasses <laughs> um so people you know either had glasses that didn't fit they didn't have glasses ones that didn't work effectively and so you had a whole whole island of people that were kind of living their life through a blur you know the ground leader notices that issue you know the ground leader understands what can be done about it so grounded leaders get the facts, are in tune with what's happening, the reality on the ground right now. So grounded leaders know what's happening now. The challenging leader knows that to get from where we are now to some better state in the future, there's going to be bumps along the road. There's going to be hurdles. And those hurdles need to be overcome. The challenging leader is that individual that can overcome those challenges for themselves and for the team. Challenging leaders. Visionary leader, you've probably heard of a visionary leader. A visionary leader has some sense of the way the world can be in the future that's different to the way of the world of today. They have a way of painting that version of the future so that other people can see it or hear it or feel it so that their vision burns inside the chests of other people. So the visionary leaders. So mark yourself across the top grid, grounded, challenging and visionary. So you may have nine numbers in your grid. You may just have a ticks or crosses. However you've marked it up is completely fine. So as I mentioned 10 minutes ago, I'd now like you to, well, I'm going to give us a bit of space, a bit of time to do your reflection. And I would love to see if you can tap me a little note that says first of all what's what do you, where do you, which one do you think you personally are strongest in so nine on the grid six people on the call shaman apologies if i don't get these <laughs> if i don't get the pronunciation pronunciation right uh, shaman chindu peter Abigail, Dean and Marco. Um, if any of you are there, um, if any of you are there on the, if any of you are there and able to post a comment, love to hear it. And uh, Dean, I'll come to your question. That's a great question. Thanks very much. I'm going to give some pay space 
for me to take a drink and for you to reflect, type me a little note, which one of those nine are you strongest in? So I don't see, I do see a wonderful question from Dean. I don't see other people typing about um, their strengths, which is cool. Let me come to your question, Dean. It's kind of, it, it's, it's relevant right now, actually. Um, typically when we run this with large groups of people, and I've had maybe, maybe a thousand people do this, generally visionary leader, Vision and leadership is the one that people say they feel less comfortable with. That's, that's where they feel they fall short. It's interesting you picked out authentic leadership. So I imagine that's what you're imagining is that where most leaders fall short. And I think the world creates a tension around authentic leadership. And we grow up and we're educated in a certain way to say, this is how leadership is done. This is the way to be leaders. And um, that limits our ability to be authentic because we believe we have to act in a certain way. You know, so some stereotypes of leaders that we could have which would prevent us from being genuine and real. So something around, you know, all leaders have great charisma. Okay, so if I'm not charismatic, A, I'm either, I won't be a leader or B, I've got to go and pretend to have some charisma. Neither of those are going to, are going to help you be, be authentic. So, you know, there's these myths that exist about, about leadership. Because we see the leaders that are um, in the public eye, we see the leaders that, yeah, who are on stage, on TV, making a splash. Um, people like Donald Trump. And you think, okay, here we are, guys become a leader. Uh, he has charisma. Maybe I need to be like that or more like that. I think another stereotype of leadership, we feel like leaders need to kind of be really strong, all seeing, all knowing, have the answers. And yet what we talk about in our programs is that the really strong leaders show vulnerab vulnerability. They're open to saying, look, I don't know. They're open to saying you know what, this is a weaker area of mine, I think you're better at this than me, would you take this on? And so again, there's this myth that leaders have to be great at everything. And that, again, prevents us from being authentic, because there's stuff I'm not good at. I'm not good at detail. My my spelling is atrocious. Um, I miss stuff that that's detailed things. And we have to be real about that, because there's other stuff I know I'm really great at. So... Um, Interesting you pick out authentic. I think a lot of people would say, of course, I'm being real, but I think actually when you dig into it, um, maybe people aren't as free to be authentic as they would like to be. And so quite often wear a mask in society or with other individuals that they maybe wouldn't like to be wearing. Dean, I've also noticed you've, add, you've added another comment here now, which I'm trying to pick up. Because it's a longer comment, <laughs> so it'll take me a little bit longer just to read. But let me let me get it. I get it on the computer rather than flicking through my phone. And uh, well, today with the result. Whoa! <laughs> you draw me into politics. Um, so, 
Dean's question, in the world today with results such as Brexit and Trump, which areas of leadership shown by the candidates behind his campaigns have been most effective and resonate with the electorate? That is a super loaded question. Um, how to pull these things apart and also not get drawn into something that's still um, not landed in my mind. So this is, I think, a really interesting ongoing conversation between me and the participants of our programmes because I'm not quite sure, so I don't want to jump to some kind of answer. Clearly, Trump has resonated you know, with half of the popular opinion in America. So there's stuff there that he's led, you know, and people have followed. So if you're saying, um, show me a leader, I would say, show me some followers. And in the, in the States, there's quite a few million of them. So he's leading. And I can have a judgment over the way he's lead, leading, and I can have a judgment that I don't like it. Um, and maybe I need to update myself rather than reject it and go into, that's bad, I'm right, he's wrong. That's not going to be helpful. So I guess I'm still in a processing thing. And the kind of questions you've just asked is a good question to keep on processing that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to duck the question, Dean. Um, but very happy to, for me and you or anybody else to kind of continue that kind of question. Because it's been on my mind. And the question is, when we're looking at iconic leaders, and I talk to my groups of university students and say, who do you admire as a leader? I would love it not to be somebody like Donald Trump when I ask that question of my kids. But hey, let's leave the politics. So I had some other questions that came in that were offline. Dean, fine. I love the tough questions. Keep them coming. <laughs> um, I think I've talked through. So the question was, what are the characteristics of each mode? I think I've talked briefly about some characteristics. So here we go. Next question from Nichelle was, what are some tools or resources that you might recommend for strengthening our capacities in each of the modes and how did you strengthen yours? Um, right. I'm choosing which two I want to go with first. So tools or resources. Once you've identified one area that you want to work on and you don't want to be working on all nine at one go, that's just... You'll be thin on them all. So pick one that you most like to develop. And that one is likely to be the one that have the biggest difference to your team. So it's not necessarily the one you feel is weakest, but kind of what will make the biggest difference to my team right now in terms of the impact that we have. Um, and for each one of these, they're big topics. So let's say you wanted to um, develop your coaching leadership so that you're bringing out the best in your team. Maybe you imagine that you are the linchpin in the team and that everybody has to come to you for the answers. So you want to give them some capability so that they can make they can feel empowered to make decisions. So maybe that's your goal. Um, so how do you develop coaching? Um, you can do a master's degree in coaching, a full-time master's degree for an entire year. Uh, and that might be right for you. And it might not be. You can Google. So that if you just put in you know, Google coaching, you'll come up with something, a PDF, where you can get the basics of coaching in kind of 10 minutes. So my suggestion here is let's use a coaching model to find out what it is for you that it is that you'd like to do. And some of you may have done some coaching training in the past and you may have come across something called GROW. And the GROW is an acronym. And you may want to look this up because it's useful like across it's useful to help yourself develop and coach yourself and you can use it across all the other nine kind of areas that are in this grid so um, the grow model if you were to look it up the g stands for the goal so what is the goal so precisely what is the goal so you might say i want to develop a coaching leader um no actually let's let's take something different actually um I want to develop a visionary leadership. So the goal then says, how do you get really precise about what that means? You might have heard of the acronym SMART. So how do you make visionary leadership smart? So you can get really clear. So you could be saying, 
on the 1st of January 2017, I want to be clearly articulating to the people that work with me and the people that are my customers what the vision is for the organization that I'm running for the one year, for 2017, and for three years. I would like for them to get that vision so it burns inside of them as strongly as it burns inside of me. And then you want to think of some way of measuring that, which I can't come up with right now. But you get a sense we go from going this kind of theoretical, I want to be a visionary leader, to you know, the goal, precisely what you want to be doing, with whom, by when. So we're getting that Jesus goal. R in the growing model, reality, present reality. So present reality could be, um, I have no vision of this organisation next year, and certainly not for three years' time. Your present reality could be, I know the vision, it's in my head, and I've never written it down and told anybody about it. The present reality could be, I've told people my vision, but I don't get the sense that they could explain it back to me. So I don't think it's really landed in their hearts. So you've got to be true. What the R is how things are now. O then, O is where you go. What options do I have to develop myself as a visionary leader? And you try and go, what's the first thing that comes in my head? What's the second thing? What would my mum do? What would my best mate do? What would Donald Trump do? He would do something different, I imagine. What would he do? So what you're doing here is no judgment about what you are going to do. You're just growing all of the options that you could do. You know, 5, 10, 15, fill a page of all the things you could possibly do to develop yourself. That's asking around, that's searching on the web, that's reading a book, it's picking two or three role models that you think are amazing at Vision Leader and reading around about them. When you've got your long list, then the W on the grow model is what will you do? So that's now you've got your long list. Choose one. Choose two. Maximum two. What are you going to do? Okay, I'm going to enrol on an online coaching program. Uh, and exactly when will I do it? I'll do it on Friday. Right. Is there anything stopping me doing that? Yes, it costs 50 quid. $50. I don't have that money. Okay, right, cross it off, not an option. Well, maybe it is. Maybe you go find the £50. So you see, you're getting really practical about the very first step. No one's going to turn you from being a 0 out of 10 vision leader to a 10 out of 10 vision leader overnight. That journey might feel massive. Yeah, so it's all about making the first step. So, Nichelle, thanks for your question. I've picked one there, which is vision leader. But that methodology using the GROW model, G-R-O-W model, uh, can be applied to any of those different nine sections. So whatever it is that you want to be working on, whether it be your adult leaders or grounded leaders, yeah, precisely what's your goal, uh, what's your present reality, what options exist, and then what's the very first step, what will you do? And you'll start to move. And when you start to move, the second step becomes easier. And the third step becomes easier. So over time, and again, I'm learning in all of these zones. So um, there we go. That, I think, answers your question. Uh, you also said, how do I strengthen mine? Um, how do I strengthen mine? It's an ongoing perpetual learning journey. So I would say one of my strongest ones is journeying leader. So... Um, I know that I am not the perfect specimen of humanity and I also know I never will be. And if I judge myself against that benchmark, then I'm always going to be criticising myself, which is unhelpful. Um, so I'm not saying I'm always striving to be something and I'm unhappy with who I am now. But what I am saying is that um, the tot of now, the tot of tomorrow can be better than the tot of now. And so whatever I'm doing, whatever thing I do well, don't do well, is completely fine. So I, I think one of my strengths is that I'm a journeying leader. Um, and then that helps me, I guess. And so what was your question? How do I strengthen minds? By doing what felt right in the moment. So um, when I wanted to become a coach, yeah, because that was my profession, I went and did a professional coaching qualification. Um, at the moment, when it felt right in a project that I'm launching, 
quarter one in 2017, actually. So about 18 months ago, I had to write the vision. It was in my head and I had to get it out and put it on a, or put it, build a website so other people could see that vision. So that felt right for me in that moment. And I guess when I did that, wrote it out, it was pretty good. Maybe seven out of 10 good. Um, and other people who do that kind of stuff for a living, then I invited to have a look at it and to probe it and challenge it. And what they did was made it better. And now I've learned from their methodology about how I would structure, say, the story on the internet, on the on the web page, how it flows, the language that I'm using. So my learning on that was through an iterative journey of feedback. The one that I'm struggling with right at the moment is challenging leader so if I say where's my weakness right now is challenging so again relating to that same project we're due to get off the ground in quarter one 2017 and there's some real hurdles in the way and I'm struggling with those hurdles I'm struggling with keeping the motivation just to keep on going and it feels like I'm chipping away at a wall and there's little lumps coming off but the wall seems big and I'm struggling with how I, I know, think differently to get around the wall or simply just persevere and keep on hammering at it. And uh, so that's the one for me which is currently weak and would get in the way of the vision being realised. And this is where a team comes in. So selecting your team is important. So I'm not saying you're going to be the best at every single thing on this grid and there would be other people that are good and you want those other people in your team. So the team strength needs to be strong in all of these areas. And I've got my business partner on this new project. He's just so strong at challenge, being a challenging leader and helping me to overcome the challenges. Let me time check. 8.50. We'll go for another 10 minutes or so, depending on what more questions come through. Okay, so another question here, I think a little bit related to Dean's question earlier. So, um, do you find that leaders tend to have proficiency in one axis? As in, they are great leaders of self. Or, are they great at envisioning the future for other people? Okay, so, so the axis. Um, I would say that kind of, let's go bottom left to top right really. I would say that there, there is no great leader in the world who isn't um, able to be authentic. Yeah, let me go with that sweeping cat generalisation because I can't think of an example. You may, you may be able to come up with an example of a leader from your society or life who has been a great leader but not authentic. I can't think of one. So yeah, all great leaders are authentic. I'll make that statement and open to the challenge on it. Um, and all great le all leadership starts with self, so I also can't imagine a great leader not also being on their own personal journey and accepting that they're not and accepting that they're not perfect. So I think the axis that all great leaders would be strong on would be self leadership. Okay, what's going on inside here? Um, and then the other ones, I guess, once that in place, the other ones I've got a bit more looseness about them. So um, some great leaders might be great personally, but maybe not great interpersonally. Uh, and they might jump a step. I'm also thinking how people talk about Steve Jobs. They talk about Steve Jobs as being this amazing revision leader. He would talk about things in the future that no one had ever thought of before, as if they were here now. I don't know if you guys remember when the iPad first came out. You know, this is the first tablet computer. And I remember people saying, well, what's it for? I remember my mum saying, what's it for? And I said, well, it does what my phone does now, except it's too big to put in my pocket and I can't make any phone calls. So she said, well, what's it for? <laughs> uh, so fascinating, isn't it? If you'd have asked consumers, should we make your phone bigger and then not make phone calls? They'd have said no, but Steve Jobs had this vision that people would want tablet computers, and now, of course, here they are. So people talk about him in an amazingly visionary leader kind of way, but they say actually he wasn't good interpersonally. Um, so he would be relatively weak in the adult space, you know, how he connected with other people, how he had empathy. 
So, Nichelle, there are definitely great leaders who work more strongly in one of these nine kind of modes of leadership than in others. So I suggest the foundation of self needs to be there uh, and who we look at as great leaders can maybe have strength in other areas. Which is actually going to contradict what I'd like to say next, which is that for you to be a great leader, you want to have the ability to work across these nine modes. And so just developing the strength and visionary leadership, like Steve Jobs did, um, I think he was a rare beast. And that for the majority of us mortals, that we would want to actually have some proficiency in all of the different modes of leadership. So working across them and using each of them um, appropriately in the moment would be the right thing to do. Anything else I'd like to say? So there's one more question come in. Dean, do you have any final questions just while I read this one out? Uh, Francis, I've noticed that you're there. You may be able to um, or may wish to make a contribution um, in this last five minutes or so. So as you're thinking and type potentially typing uh, the last question that came from Nushal again. How do you constantly hold the space and time access in view in a way that's energising and not fatiguing, particularly when it's about focusing on the now and in the future? Hey Francis, nice that you're here. Um, I'm going to pull this apart, Michelle, into, two, into certainly two different answers. What I found really interesting when I'm working with kind of groups of people and there's live discussion around this is, yeah, how do you kind of stay present, grounded, mindful of this moment? Because it's only in this moment that life exists, huh? It's only in this moment that we can experience the sensations that we're feeling of love or joy or sadness. So... We have to spend a good portion of our life here, real, now. So there's a tension between doing that and doing that fully. And then also allowing your mind to wander, to fantasise about what could be the future for you or for the world or for other people. So you can see these things as kind of you know, competing for time and attention. And I'd say rather than imagine them as competing, they're complementary, you know, the... The joy of living now, part of, let's say, for me, part of the joy of living now is to be inspired about what could be in the future. Um, and the joy of life can't be all about imagining the future. The joy of life has got to be experienced through sensations now. So they've got to work together. So my question for, um, my question in this is that, do you feel like you're appropriately balanced? That would be the question. Um, and for me, I think I'm over, I spend more time thinking about the future and not being present than I perhaps could do and should do. So my work would be about kind of being more grounded, being more mindful and, and here. And my wife is the opposite, actually. Um, she's amazing at living this moment right now, experiencing life here and spends less time about planning for the future. So her development uh, may be, if she wished to, about thinking about things for the future. So it's whatever is appropriate kind of to dance between the two. Um, and you talk about here, so that's the, that's the now and future kind of challenge and dimension. Um, and, and I think the question itself quite, felt quite fatiguing. So you're talking about constantly holding space and time in view. And then talking about something that's fatiguing if you're trying to do that. So just my suggestion is kind of be light with yourself with this stuff. No need to hold it constantly in view. I don't hold it constantly in view. I have the benefit that frequently I'm talking about this matrix and these dimensions with groups of people. So that kind of refreshes it back in my mind and says, you know, Todd, are you living this stuff? And is there anything that um, you need to be reminded of? So... Um, yeah, no need, I would say, to be harsh on yourself to bring them up constantly. By having a look at them now and reflecting on them now, then that's cool. Um, if you were to put a note in your diary, say, come back to it. 
in three months time that's nice as well so before I wrap up I'm just going to briefly read the comments that Francis has put up just to check if there's anything uh, kind of new or different that we want to cover in the last couple of minutes So, Francis, gosh, <laughs> you ask a hard question. Um, have, so, Francis's question. Have you experienced leading on one path, realising it's not the way that you want to go? Right, I'm stop there and do that one. Yes. <laughs> um, my leadership style before doing what I do now, so my leadership style in corporate, or a lot more... Um, um, I'm more command and control, really, if I'm honest. A lot more that I thought I knew the answer, and I'll just tell you what my answer is, and I'd like you to go and do it. Um, so my path, I knew that I had to change that and became more of a coaching leader. So yes, have I? Yes. I think your question here is not necessarily about a personal kind of leading oneself. It's about leading you know, a group of people in a direction. So yes, again, if any of you read a book, um, called The Lean Startup, which is a great book about kind of um, being an entrepreneur and running startups. Um, and in there it talks about kind of pivoting. So there is, I imagine, I imagine if you are a person that wrote a plan on a piece of paper um, that had like kind of one year, three year, five year goals and targets and vision, and you're exactly doing that, then... Um, you're unique. I have never met an entrepreneur who's written a plan and stuck to it and that's been the right plan. So in the book it talks about pivots. So it talks about having a plan, learning some new stuff as you go and then pivoting your plan as you go. So not ripping it up and throwing it out but just taking the grounded stuff that you're learning and kind of adapting it and tweaking it. So yeah of course I think everybody um, will have led some people against one vision and then have to kind of shift and 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 go with it how do you take people on that journey is to take people on that journey from the start um so instead of saying right this is what we're doing we're selling one million of these things in 2017 and we're going to sell them through these channels and uh, i don't want to hear any different the way you take people with them is to be the adult leader from the start you know so we're connected in a non-hierarchical way where what they see because what they see will be different to what you see, is valued and honoured, and they're adding to the richness of your knowledge all the way through. So when they say to you, look, boss, this isn't working, then you're okay, great, okay, let's pull it all in, let's get grounded, let's get the facts how they are now, and let's together work out, should we pivot, or should we persevere? So absolutely, taking people with you is all about having the adult-to-adult -adult relationship right from the start. Or, this is the last bit of your question, and this is the last one I'll do before I wrap up. Or, possibly end a relationship where purposes aren't aligned. Um, so here's a good question. There are lots and there are, there are as many different ways of doing something as um, the numbers of people that exist in your team. So doing things a Todd way isn't always the right way. You know, and we're a team of three that founded Lead Now, and the methodology behind the way we would do something is different depending on each of us because we're all being authentic. Yeah? So we can all recognise we've got different methods, uh, different behaviours, yeah? and that's completely fine and completely natural and should be celebrated. You're talking here about purpose, which is deeper than that. So the thing that we can bond us together is that. Um, we've had the conversation about purpose, about why we exist, about why this thing that we're creating, this social enterprise called Lead Now, why it exists and what our mission is. And so when we're mission aligned and purpose aligned, all of the other stuff about how we do things day to day, yeah, we can respect one another's points of view on that. So you need, so you need to be connected at a purpose level. And if you're not, then maybe it is time to part ways. And not in an acrimonious, well, you're wrong, I'm right kind of way. It's just, look, you know, I want to follow this purpose. This fills me with energy and passion. And your purpose is this, fine. You know, I want you to be wonderfully successful. Go live that. And it's just not where I get my energy from. 
but my challenge here is let's just check it's about purpose yeah, and not about behaviours because you may actually have the same purpose just different views on the way you should go about achieving it so don't throw away don't throw out people who disagree because you're disagreeing about methodology if actually you're connected at a purpose level because those people if they can get to agreeing on purpose would make an amazing team So I think I'm going to call that a day. I think I've been talking um, enough. I think an hour of watching this back on catch up uh, would be enough. And I'm completely open to getting questions or comments or suggestions kind of uh, through the Facebook live uh, feed um, or by email. So if any of you wanted to contact me by email, Francis would let you have those details. Wonderful for those of you who have been with me for the whole hour. Wonderful that some of you joined for part of it and uh, then had other priorities to get to. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Dean, Francis, thanks for being here right to the end. Um, I was going to say love you all. I perhaps do. And uh, have a really lovely day. See you all soon one day, I hope. Bye-bye.